Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Alabama White Paint Day 2022. <laughs> My name is Melissa Smith, and I'm a lawn rehabilitation specialist here at Birmingham VA Medical Center. Um, Eleven years ago, I was doing my internship at the Arena VA in orientation and mobility. Um, my father, Jesse Dean Smith, also a mobility specialist, introduced me to the bill. While at the VA, I participated in their white paint celebration that they had been doing ever since 1982. When I graduated, I started working for the Alabama Department of Rehabilitation Services and thought, why not get this in the year we live in? for the entire state of Alabama. Ashley Townsend, who was originally uh, supposed to be given the welcome today, was my supervisor at the time, and he, along with Sidney Jones, the then AIPB uh, case manager for the welcome, helped me turn my vision into a reality. Ashley has been the head of blind and deaf services for the state of Alabama for the past year. He sends his well wishes, and he wanted to let you all know that he really wanted to be here today. But sadly, COVID hit, and we were forced to go online for two years. We had to plan to, to come back to Birmingham and then to Auburn. Each time these events were planned, as we were getting cl close, a new variant reared its ugly head. While online, we started making, uh, make, making a national presence, and then in the second year, we even had people watching. Good afternoon, my name is Kelly Sanchez. I am the O&M in the Mobile office. We have been waiting for this get together for three years, and just lucky that it is our 10th anniversary, so we revitalized it and wanted to make it the biggest white paint day event ever. Pulled off. I am so glad. I know, don't want you. <laughs> I can say that we pulled it off. Over 400 people pre-registered, and we have had more come today. White Paint Day is about raising awareness of our blind and visually impaired folks. We are all mobility specialists, and we are so lucky to be blessed to not have a career, but a calling where we get to help instill those abilities that lead to our friends who are blind or visually impaired. Succeed. And now we have the School for the Blind to do the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for remaining standing. We now have our own ADRS Jill Rossiter to sing the national anthem.
get around safely and efficiently and be independent from all other things, from all, and all other individuals. Recently, I conducted this research study uh, talking about the importance of born in and matriculation from college. So basically, in layman's terms, how important born in is to individuals who are college and how does it affect them when they graduate. And 100% of the students that I talked to said that if they did not have great born in skills, they probably would not have finished college. I don't know about you, but I work on the college campus every day and there's so much traffic and so many barriers and so many different routes to take to get to different places. And by the way, I'm only instructing myself, so I might do some more times while I'm standing here. And so they, they use different routes and they say that it was very important to them that they didn't have to wait on others to be able to come get them from the dormitories to be able to make it to the classrooms which also helped them with being independent, which also led to them being able to graduate one time and feel connected to the college campus. So on end is very, very important. The Lions Club, let's talk about the Lions and the Lions Club. I know some of them are in the audience today. <laughs> so the Lions Club began in 1917 by Mr. Melvin Jones in Chicago. And then in 1920, they went international. They started a partnership with Blindness in about 1925 after Helen Keller addressed the Lions Club International, and she gave them a challenge. She said that they should become Knights for Blindness and the Crusade, Knights for the Blind and the Crusade Against Blindness. And from the day forward, Lions World had been working with blind and visually impaired individuals. But here's another important thing that most people don't know. In 1930, John Monahan, uh, which was the president of the Lions Club in Illinois, he suggested the idea that we use a white cane with a, with a red band on it to be able to identify blind and visually impaired people that they are traveling. So that's where the cane comes from with a white and red band. Now, there are different types of canes. Um, if you uh, know anything about our names, then you can have an ALB cane, which is kind of uh, uh, short. It comes right between the breastbone. You can have an NLB cane, which is a little longer. But the thing about it is, it doesn't matter what type of cane you have, it's going to be able to move around safely and independently. Now, the method that they would use with our name, came about by Dr. Richard Hooper. He developed this method after World War II after there were a lot of blind veterans who came home. And um, so he said, hey, you know, we, we need to start working on getting these men back into the field of work. And so he started coming up with different ways and different methods of um, using the cane. He came up with the Richard Hooper method, which is still taught right now, but we use that method when we are uh, teaching on them as a lot instructors. Also, there are some other things that happened. The Randolph Shepherd Act. This is a great act because it provides persons with uh, blind and visual impairments the ability to operate vending facilities on federal properties. I know, I know they are, so we have a um, federal vending program in the state capital. And it is ran by a blind and visually impaired individual who has been doing it for about 20 years. So there are some, in, in conjunction with White Cane Safety Day, there are some other things that took place that also helps um, blind and visually impaired individuals. The ADA Act of 1990 gives that some teeth. So that means that people who receive federal funding, they have to recognize individuals with disabilities. That is important. If there is no one to speak out and who's going to help, I have the unique ability to be able to do my work and my job and they get to say it. My work is what God told me to do. My job is what pays me. On me is my job. My work is to help people they get to say So when I go to work on a daily basis, it's like a night of work. I'm doing what I like to do every day all day. And one more plug before I leave, I run the ONM program at the University.
University of Arkansas at Little Rock. And we are always looking for individuals who want to get into the field of orientation and mobility. Thank you. We are glad to be back. So please welcome Denise Bell, Birmingham Director of Capital Improvements, to read the city proclamation. Good afternoon. I am so excited to be here to greet you guys on behalf of Mayor Randall Bell Wilson on White Cane's 10th anniversary celebration. I am Denise Bell, and I serve as the director of the city's Department of Capital Projects. It's an honor and certainly a privilege to stand before you all on the mayor's behalf, who could not be here today. However, we would like to share that the city is continuously working to not only be more inclusive in our city planning and design efforts, but to promote and encourage our partners to do the same. Therefore, on behalf of Mayor Woodford, I am excited to move this proclamation. Whereas the white king by allowing every blind person to move freely and safely from place to place makes it possible for the blind to fully participate in and contribute to our society and to live the lives they want. And whereas the city of Birmingham law calls upon employers, both public and private, to be aware and utilize the employment skills of our blind citizens by recognizing their worth as individuals and their productive capacities. Now, therefore, I, Randall L. Wolfman, Mayor of the City of Birmingham, Alabama, do hereby proclaim October 14, 15, 2022 as White King Awareness Day in Birmingham, Alabama, and do call upon our schools, colleges, and universities offer full opportunities for training to blind persons upon employers and the public to utilize the available skills of competent blind persons and to open new opportunities for the blind in our rapidly growing and changing society. And upon all our citizens to recognize the white king as a tool of independence for blind pedestrians on our streets and our highways. Thank you. services for those with disabilities, and much of that is due to the Alabama Governor's Office on Disability. Known as good, and it truly is. Please welcome Alabama's Assistant Attorney General and good Executive Director, Graham Sisson, to read Governor Kayhock's proclamation for this year's White Cane Day.
and white paint in the state of Alabama. Given under my hand to the great seal of the office of the governor of the state capitol of the city of Montgomery on the 28th day of September 2022. Hey, I the governor.
Alabama as one of the leading Randolph Shepherd programs in the country. And that's thanks to folks like Joe Helm, uh, who used to do with the department, and all of our help currently through Deaf and Byron and our program for the bond uh, business enterprise program for bond vendors. Thank you to all of the bond vendors for continuing to uh, look for additional opportunities for lending across this great state. Again, I want to thank Dr. Massia, I don't know who will be up there next, but I also want to thank you for being here, and I want to thank you for what you do. Thank you, and have a great listening. Thank you, Commissioner Hirschhoff. Now to introduce a man who needs no introduction, AIDU President, Dr. John Massey. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Great to be together. It's this Joe's great to see you. And even a couple of people um, that I can't wait to go and, uh, and hug. It's great, great that we're all together. Commissioner, thanks for your words, and um, yes, it is all about partnerships and working together to make sure people who are blind or, or who have um, any level of vision loss live the life that they want to live. That's what we're here for. We don't exist without all of you, and we're just so blessed and grateful to be able to work on behalf of you and for you, so thank you for that. Appreciate you. Commissioner said, said it all. Let me go in a little bit of a different direction. First, let me say that on behalf of AIDB, I want to express our appreciation to the Alabama Department of Rehabilitation Services and to the VA and to all of our partners um, for planning and hosting this event. And while we're proud to sponsor and recognize the professionals in the field, I want to recognize, and I know the Commissioner, and we all want to recognize you the blind community. I mean, we're here ultimately to celebrate the achievements of people who are blind and visually impaired. And the symbol of blindness is the tool of independence, the white cane. And so at, you know, at its heart, AIDB is a civil rights institution that has been working since 1858 to level the playing field for individuals who are blind and deaf. And you all have heard me say that before. Many of you We'll know the blind boys of Alabama, right? You know the blind boys of Alabama? <laughs> <laughs> I personally have been blessed to have developed a close relationship with Jimmy Carter, I call him Mr. Carter. Um, he's not the previous president. Mr. Carter will tell you he's the younger Jimmy Carter. He's 90. <laughs> and he also holds the distinction of being the last surviving and performing member of the original group. And you know, arguably, the blind boys of Alabama are the highest achieving members of the AAB family, and I don't think they get enough recognition. I don't think Mr. Carter gets enough recognition. We can talk about a lot of reasons why, but I'm so grateful to be able to be part of this and to, to talk just a little bit about it. Mr. Carter and his original bandits, they all attended the school um, for the blind and all that, when it was segregated. They didn't always get the best instruments and the best environment. Um, and I, and when you are, is struck, whereas we are struck by the amount of courage they've shown over this course of time. The original band members had their courage forged in the fire of their early childhood, um, growing up with um, visual loss of African American children in the segregated South. They took on a life circumstance that would have derailed many people and it turned into a firm foundation upon which to build a lifetime of success. And I think they're the epitome of what we celebrate when we celebrate White King Day. The Blind Boys of Alabama toured throughout the Jim Crow River South in the 1940s and 50s, going on to sing the benefits for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Their reach is now worldwide. The Blind Boys of Alabama have been groundbreakers in their own right, going places and doing things that would seem impossible to those who view blindness as a barrier to living a strong.
strong, independent, fulfilling life. For Mr. Carter and the one who is traveling today, I would like to offer him and the others a warm hearted appreciation for their courage by letting you all know that we'll be honoring Jimmy and, and the, the body boys later with a resolution for his courage and purchasing $1,000 worth of white cans in Jimmy's honor to be distributed to consumers in need. So today on the ground, I'm surrounded by people with that same fire and determination that Mr. Carter has to live a limitless life. And you too are breaking ground, are breaking down barriers every single day. You are groundbreakers and modern day innovators, proving every day that anything is possible. You are also to be commended, and to you as well, I offer my sincere appreciation for your tenacity and inspiration that you offer me and others. You give us courage. And we thank you. AIDD is thrilled to support the blind community and celebrate your accomplishments today and every day. May God bless each and every one of you. Thank you, President Massey. This being our 10th anniversary, we wanted to do something different, something big, and we think we pulled it off. For those of you who have been with us in, in the past, don't worry, we are not walking a long distance. Sit back and relax. The show's about to begin. We will be starting with Rachel Hodge, a singer and songwriter who is also an alumnus of the Alabama School of the Blind.
all for this today. Hello, everyone. My name is Stevie Wonder, and I'm so glad you all came on today. <laughs> I was born on Saturday, May 13th, 1950, at Stephen Hardaway Jenkins in Saginaw, Michigan, and raised in inner city Detroit. I was an accomplished musician by age eight, and I had my very first recording at age 12 in age 1962. I got the name Little City Wonder from Motown Records then. My career began taking off in my early years. My biggest product at the time was Fingertips Part 2, which charted number one on US Pop and on our new Billboard charts. I released that song while I was still in middle school as a preteen. A few years later, on my 21st birthday, I decided to take my time elsewhere and resign my contract with Motown Records. During this time, I released two albums independently. 11 months after my departure, Motown offered me another contract which included complete creative control and rights to all my songs. Now, I'd be a fool to turn that down. <laughs> so <I'd be> <laughs> I've been with Motown ever since, and I'm still making music with them to this day. I'm the first artist in history to chart number one on a single in a completely different country. I achieved this last song with a song, Ebony and Ivory, in 1982. Just two years later, I released I Just Called to Say I Love You, which charted number one on U.S. Pop, U.S. R&B, U.S. Adult Contemporary, and the U.K. Billboard charts. The song even got me my first Academy Award in 1985. Over the span of my life, I've earned a grand total of 25 Grammys, plus the Grammy Lifetime Award. I've been the recipient of numerous NAACP awards. I have the BET Honors Award, somewhere in my house. <laughs> and I've even won a soldier in the war. Now you can find all of my awards and accomplishments online, unfortunately, or fortunately, I can not list them all in there. But uh, thank you for uh, coming out and listening to me. Hope y'all have a very good day. <laughs> and remember, I just called to say I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Now I would like to call Kelly Sanchez to the As the mobility specialist, I am a baby, so it is a fitting that I get to give out the orientation and mobility legacy of the Alabama Vision Achievement Awards. The legacy award is given to a mobility specialist that has left a lasting legacy to our field and those with vision loss. Our recipient is Jesse D. Smith. Mr. Smith was one of the first mobility specialists in the state and has trained hundreds in the use of right cane. Now his daughter, Yolanda Smith, is an o &M. Mr. Smith could not be with us today, so it is my pleasure to award this to his family. If y'all want to come to the stage. On behalf of Jesse Smith, thank you for this honor and professional recognition. This honor tells me I made a difference. I enjoyed my work and feel that I made a difference in the life of this special population. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Ian.
I became ill with scarlet fever. Because of my illness, I lost my hearing and vision. My parents sought help for me as I seemed to be losing my connection with the world and those around me. When I was six years old, the famous Alexander Graham Bell connected my parents with the Perkins School for the Blind. They sent Anne Sullivan to Alabama to work with me. At this point in my life, I was defiant and out of control. Because I did not understand communication, this resulted in my acts of disobedience. When Sullivan arrived, I made it difficult for her. It was always when I connected the field of running water with the word water, I began making rapid progress. As the years progressed, I learned more than anybody thought I ever would. With teachers' constant help and encouragement, I was able to graduate high school and be the first step upon a woman to graduate from Radcliffe College. As a result, I wrote books, I performed in vaudeville, shows to demonstrate my ability to speak and sign. I also acted as an ambassador for the American Foundation for the Body and traveled all over the world to advocate for blind and deaf blind people. I will leave you with these words. The only thing worse than being blind is having sight but no vision. Thank you, everyone. Um, our next award uh, recipient is the group for Alabama Vision Achievement Award. It's for those professionals who uh, have really shaped our field. And we, and I'm so glad to give this award to Joseph P. Helen Jr. He uh, used to be our commissioner for the Alabama Department of Rehab Services. Um, and also, he's a member of the uh, Alabama, he, he's the past president of the Alabama chapter of the AER, which is the Association for Education and Rehabilitation of the Blind and Visually Impaired. Uh, I'm also a member, so it was, it's really great to give you this award because he had really shaped and helped those uh, who are blind and visually impaired like myself uh, be, become gainfully employed. Thank you. My uh, former boss and mentor at Auburn University, Dr. Robert Hill Couch, used to preach to us when we were in grade school to always be prepared. You never know when you might have a speaking part. And uh, I just want to say that uh, first and foremost, let me say a heartfelt thank you to the White King Committee and others who may have been involved in expending the energy and effort to consider me for the special recognition. As you know, a vision or goal is never achieved without effort. And I also want to say thank you to Dr. Mary Jean Sandsbury and Jesse Smith who have also been honored as well as other people here. I'm delighted to be here. Our faculty, I hate to I'd be in for standing up. You know what a shock and surprise when I got uh, Melanie Brown email with the subject line and said Joseph B. Jones Jr. the novel legacy. My first thought was John Mayo. <laughs> Spang on holes. Her email asked, when could I be in? And I remember sending her a response that said, at the moment, I'm shocked and speechless 
And being spacious does not lend itself well for an enemy. Let's chat on Monday. Just a couple of thoughts. Uh, my personal connection to the field of blindness began in 1995 when my boss, the then commissioner, Ramon H. Lucas, asked me to administer Alabama's business enterprise program, now nationally as the Randolph Shepherd Vending Program. This work led me to join Alabama AR in August of 1997. And since that time, I've served in some capacity on the chapter's board for 25 years. I, I, I would be a little bit remiss if I didn't uh, share this one little bit with you. Uh, the Alabama AR Scholarship, there was a group of us back years ago that thought this would be a good idea to help those that were interested, such as Devon Smith, who was last year's 21, uh, not 2021 recipient of the ADL Scholarship Award. And uh, it's made a difference. This uh, November, we will be honoring our 20th uh, awardee and uh, with a $3,000 scholarship. And uh, given the work that so many uh, members of ADR did over the years, John Macy, the all of us that there were members and really active in this. Uh, in 2022, uh, we will reward the, uh, award the 20th uh, scholarship. And to date, uh, we will have given $37,200 in scholarships to those 20 people. <laughs> in that account will allow the Alabama chapter of AR to donate $3,000 to a person that's interested in working in the field of blindness for the next 45 years without ever raising another dime. And in closing, let me just say that I'm most grateful and appreciative for the many persons that influenced my thinking and helped me along the way and contributed to my life's experiences. Being pretty much on my own since seven, I was influenced by my grandparents, uncles, aunts, teachers, coaches, childhood, high school, college friends, and buddies from the United States Army. I am grateful for the many work and professional colleagues like John and Jane Elizabeth that I have met and continue to work with over my 44 year work career. I'm most grateful for my wife, Beverly, and all our children, our grandchildren, and uh, I'm grateful for my health and my continued ability to help others through my work with Southern Disability Foundation, the Achievement Center, Easter Shields, and Old Black, and the Alabama ADR chapter. You know, the challenges and barriers faced by persons with a disability, whether congenital or acquired, is part of the human experience. Improving the life, independence, and dignity of persons with disabilities is and has been an evolving and continuous journey. While we may have made improvements in societal attitudes, advocacy, the invention and use of assistive technology, passages of laws like ADA, our journey is far from over. And I wish each of you the very best as you continue your journey to improve the lives of others. Thank you. I think it is everyone's obligation they owe to themselves and to their lives to figure out their own way up their own mountain. Hello, I am Eric Weinmayer, and I climb mountains. I was born on September 23rd, 1968, in Princeton, New Jersey. At 15 months old, I was diagnosed with juvenile retinoscosis and was expected to lose all of my vision 
by age 13. When I was a child, I loved to play football, basketball, and ride bikes. When I first went blind, I refused to learn braille or use a cane, but at age 16, I chose to use a guide dog. I began wrestling at my high school, and this eventually led me to a career as a wrestling coach. I attended Boston College and graduated with a double major in English and Communication. I married my wife, Ellie, in August of 1997. We had our first child, Emma, in 2000, and our second, Arjun, two years later. I have climbed the seven summits, which are seven mountains, one on each of the seven continents. I am the only blind man to have reached the summit of Mount Everest. I accomplished this feat in 2001. I published my book, Touch the Top of the World, on March 25, 2002. I have kayaked 277 miles down the Colorado River and reached the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Today, I lead children and veterans on high-impact adventure experiences. I have shared speaking platforms with luminaries such as Secretary Colin Powell, President Bill Clinton, and Prime Minister Tony Blair. I challenge my audiences to always live their lives to the fullest. The most important award I have ever received is the Helen Keller Lifetime Achievement Award. Thank you. And now I'm proud to introduce Melody Brown. Our next vision achievement award is in honor of our teachers who are visually impaired. Um, I would like for you all to understand that the award is the Jesse B. Smith Award, the Joseph T. Town Jr. Award, and the Dr. Mary Jean Sanchez Award are foundational awards. These are honorable awards. We hope in the future to find people who feed into our field and to our clients and into ourselves the way these people have. So, and with much faith and fear and honor and awareness that we do present these. Um, teachers of the visual impairment, or as they are called now, teachers of students with visual impairments, teach babies to adults everything from royal to independence to believing in themselves. Uh, everything from academic to soft skills. Um, some teachers um, inspire others like Mary Jean has, and she's inspired me to be also become a TDI. And um, when I think about her impact, it's not just me personally, she's impacted people in the state. So when you look at a TDI from Alabama that came to Mary Jean's program, you look at that thousands of lives impact over the past 30 to 40 years. This is the best part of For those who didn't have to, she went forward to pursue a doctorate so that she could get a program and continue in Alabama to provide up for everyone here. Um, she sacrificed her time that she could have been a mom or stay at home or just stay in her narrow field, but she inspires us all to go beyond our comfort zone. Um, so, um, but without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Mary Jean Sandsbury. And it's my pleasure to honor you for all that you've done, not only for me and my family, um, but also for what you've done for all of us who dare to try something different and serve. I'm just truly humbled to be honored by my friends and colleagues here in our own state of Alabama. Leadership is a God-given gift, and to be a leader, you have to be diligent and have integrity, and that's what leadership should be in our state, and we do not challenge you to continue to be the leader you can be. The agencies, organizations, foundations, friends, and other Professionals here today have all partnered with 
opened our teacher training program over the past 40 years to make sure that we had the best teachers who had a quality education. And we partnered with the hospitals, with the residential schools, the public schools, the foundations around, and with rehab to go into the different agencies with our childhood and with some of the adults. And all of this has made a difference in our state and, and with the precious children and adults that we are given the gift to serve. This award means so much to me and I'm dedicated for the future leaders here in our state who strive to give their gifts and their talents to make sure that we have our children and adults receive the best training they can. That is so very important for each one of us and for each one of the people here in this audience today to say that Alabama has the best teachers that we can get. Thank you. Now, I will be welcoming, welcoming, I think 
think I said that wrong down. Laugh at it. Don't judge it. Just laugh, all right? Um, Yo, Lanka! Creating music has become more intimate. I've always heard music and sound, but it's from a different view since one of my senses has been weakened severely. I guess it's more of me trying to convey the story or, or message through my music um, in, in a more detailed fashion. It has uh, strengthened my, my ears. Now, I've always heard music, and I've always tried to put details in songs, but now it's more like, okay, it's it's more like deeper in the rabbit hole. Like I'm, I'm getting to a deeper connection to my, my spirit and my soul. And I'm figuring out ways how to bring it out of me. And I've kind of tapped on a way to bring it out through my music and my heart. Show. And I'm going to do a song with y'all that I wrote. 
and it's, it's called Believe. I want everybody to say Believe. Yell it. Believe. Say it loud. Believe. Believe. You have to believe in yourself.
when people turn on you.